Hey, what's up? It's Mr. Bill. The track you're listening to right now is the result of a 35 hour tutorial series where I recorded the process of making this song from start to finish and explained myself along the way. If you're interested in learning how to make music or sharpening your craft, go to mrbillstunes.com and check it out. Enjoy the tune. Hey, you're listening to the Mr. Bill Podcast. Hey, you're listening to the Mr. Bill Podcast. Hey, you are listening to the Mr. Bill Podcast. Hey, you're 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 listening to the Mr. Bill Podcast. sick well yeah thanks for joining and doing this podcast i appreciate it pleasure and um yeah the stems were good uh basically i've been trying to like rearrange it to make a bit more sense i felt like it it was like a lot of different sections that didn't make a lot of sense together so i'm trying to like make three like uh like basically a side trans section and like a bass house section and then a dubstep section i'm trying to figure out which way they need yeah to that's what that's what i was figuring as well i thought uh to do the beginning is fine then i thought moving to more of the side trend thing and then coming back to bass the the in between was a bit messy i i felt that yeah but whatever you think it's hard to combine those styles like side trance is so clean and like so formula not not necessarily formulaic but like it, it sounds like Sire trans, you know, and whereas and yeah. dubstep obviously, I don't, I don't know. It just it's hard to combine the two because one is so like loud and distorted and fucked yeah. up, and the other one's super clean. The side trans section you made that was awesome. I like it a lot. Yeah, it was good. And then Eris changed that to, with the chord. It was great with the with the, with the thing. On top. thing. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was great. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah, what have you guys been up to lately? What are you working on? Um, well, we're doing a bunch of stuff actually. We're uh... <laughs> doing uh, something something that uh, unexpected is like a, we're working on a video game for a long time oh, nice. and um, um, yeah so we can't wait to show people something about this it's in VR and it's a very fun project it's Unreal Engine 5 and we're first going to release uh, some teaser of a pinball and it's going to be really crazy a sound design is really fun side of it and mm. very psychedelic game um, so this is are you having thing. are you having to mix it in um like that 360 sound thing for vr uh it's a it's happening automatic within the en engine so unreal ah. engine have like tools inside that just you just uh, place an object and the sound comes from there so mm. it's really it's really easy crazy yeah i had to i did some music once for a for a vr project called uh racket or something like that it's like a ping pong game and there was just music in it and they sent me like this tracker by waves that you attach to your headphones and it connects via bluetooth to your computer and then like as you move your head it like knows where your head is in space and like pans the racket the, nx we yeah, have racket we, NX, yeah. we had tracks there as well did and... you have to do the same thing with the headphone thing yeah, we give them stems and stuff, and um, mm. yeah, they did. It's super stems. weird that wave thing that you move inside. It feels weird. I don't know, and to yeah. mix with it was kind of weird. But yeah, yeah, we did it as well with waves. Yeah, the fun. AirPods have it as well now. The AirPods Max. Yeah, I fucking hate it. I don't even know how to turn it off. I, I don't know what to do with it. <laughs> it's horrible. I don't get yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah, you lose totally the the you know the center. Like you, you yeah. want to you wanna hear the clarity of the details of the track. I don't want to hear a reverb on top, you know? Yeah, have you heard, uh, listened to the AirPods Max when an aeroplane is taking off? It's so fucked. It, like, destroys your ears. It goes, -do 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 -do, and, like, fucks up your hearing and stuff. Because I guess, like, the sound pressure of the plane is too much for the thing to... And it's all, it's, like, it's very loud and it's, like, very unstable noise. So, like, can't cancel it out properly. It just creates this crazy pressure in your ear. And I think regardless, in reality, we're not canceling anything. We're just blasting our ears with opposite direction of phase, you know? So actually we, we're just adding more volume to our ears. So we're not really... So our, is it actually... Our brain cancels it, but, but our ears get the volume. Damn, so noise canceling is actually bad for your ears? 
I think so. I'm not an expert, but you know, that's my... Not sure. You know, we roll with it because it's fun on the plane, but is it good for you? <laughs> I don't know, you know? But I know that they blast back to you the frequencies just the opposite phase-ish, you know? So... Hmm. Yeah, I mean, it uh, makes sense. I didn't know it was bad for your hearing, though, because if it goes in opposite directions, that means the speaker doesn't move either, right? That's why it nulls out in the first place, does it not? If you have two speakers, left and right, blasting opposite phase, the speakers are still blasting each one the thing, but the room cancels it, right? But it, when it comes to your ears, there is no room in between. It's just your brain. You see what I'm saying? So... I always thought it was the speaker that cancelled it because the way a wave works is like it goes up, the speaker goes out and it goes down and the speaker sucks back in. Yeah. But if you tell it to go up and down at the same time, it just cancels and the speaker just stays there. If you stay mono. But if in uh, real life you keep left as one phase and right in different phase and you have actually real two different speakers in real life cancelling each other, not on a mono channel, you know what I'm saying? Mm. Yeah. Interesting. Well, fuck, I don't want to wear noise cancelling. Anyway, it's, pre it's pretty cool. Me. It's pretty cool. It makes your, your plane quiet. That's <laughs> fine. I don't care. So it also, damage yeah. my brain. My brain is already getting speakers for 30 years in full distortion with mid. So I don't think a little bit of <laughs> noise cancelling. Yeah. yeah, I don't think a little bit of noise cancelling will destroy that. Yeah. Yeah, good point. Yeah. Um, so what's the game about? Is it like an infected mushroom game or is it like a completely different concept for the game? It's all infected mushroom game. It's based on our uh, our albums, and uh, it's very very psychedelic oriented. And we we played a bunch of VR games that I found um, some are fun, fun, some are very like repetitive, you know. And we just try to hopefully come out of the box and su surprise people with uh, our weird minds, you know. Nice. Yeah, it's awesome that you like reaching out into all sorts of different avenues like tech avenues like making plugins and making games and all sorts of stuff i feel like um i've had this theory for a while recently about um ai like all of a sudden i'm i'm basically as good as a programmer now that has like 10 years experience because i can just go to chat gpt and say like make me a thing that does xyz and it just writes the code for me and i'm like basically as good as like an artist like a visual artist who's like done 3d shit for 10 years because i can go to stability ai and just go like stable diffusion, do this and that, and it can just do it. Not to say that obviously, like I'm not saying I'm as, as good as these people. Like, you know, the somebody who has access to like audio shit, I wouldn't consider like as good as me using audio tools for like 20 years. But at some point, maybe in the next year or two, this will be the case. Like somebody who has no audio experience is automatically a, like a professional producer. And I think once we have, um, like once we're able to condense the time that it takes to learn shit down, to like a few days instead of a whole lifetime. The combination of programming, video engine stuff, uh, programming, uh, music, all of that kind of stuff, like the way that people will combine them, I think will become like the most interesting thing. With Neuralink as well. <laughs> yeah. You just know think the... about it, you know, you just think about things, like communicate, like we can do this podcast just without anything, just thinking, you know, it's crazy. <laughs> yeah, it's possible. I think that the, but, but because of the creation of a uh, because of the AI integrating more into the music, I think it will become even more repetitive and boring because again, the pool that the AI is pulling from is what the 90 percent of musicians is doing. So it's just for me, it's like the same as you have a keyboard today that does your chord progression and everything. It's cool and it gives you an idea and it helps you. But if you don't change it yourself and do something with it yourself, then it's just the same old shit that is out there, you know? And uh, it's still up to the producer. It maybe will make his life shorter and, you know, and give him idea. But if you bring somebody, as you mentioned before, without the audio experience and the knowledge to make music, it will just sound repetitive and boring, in my opinion. That's my issue with AI. So is it a good assistant? Yeah. It's a great assistant. It's actually the best assistant. That's why ChatGPT is so successful, you know? Uh, but you need to put it, it in the right good? hands. Yeah, oh yeah. The the hands it depends who uses it, you know, for what for what purpose. And yeah, you can uh, use chat GPT in like incredibly creative ways and you can also correct. use it in incredibly boring ways too. Boring ways, you know. So yeah, and and if you go back to the percentage 
the percentage is is going to be more towards the boring way, in my opinion. Because hey, a lot of people will say now, hey, I want to be a uh, an audio creator with no knowledge. I have Chat GPT. I gonna okay, but the, would it sound <laughs> as good as somebody that has been doing music for twenty years and using Chat GPT? I don't think so. So that's that's my point with this whole mm-hmm. AI thing that is coming up in major steps now into the music uh, business. Yeah, I mean, what somebody who hasn't used audio at all, like the ideas that would occur to them in the way to use the tool would be completely different. Completely different. That would occur for yeah. somebody who has a lot of experience in that field to use the tool for sure. Yeah. But I've been using this thing lately called Dance Diffusion and you can train it on like a pool of any audio you want. So it, it only trains on three second chunks at the moment. So it's kind of shitty for making music, but it's really good for making one shots. So I'll train it on just like a ton of snares that I like or like a ton of kicks that I like. And then now I have some models that can just generate like a thousand kicks or a thousand snares for me overnight while I sleep, which is kind of cool. Also, oh, definitely, I think definitely it helps. It's like, listen, back in the day when Splice came out, everybody says, oh, what's going on? Everybody uses the same sound. But the thing with Splice is there's so many good stuff in there and so many ideas. It helps you with the creation. But again, it depends who uses it. That's what I'm saying. The AI right, yeah. is a great tool. <laughs> and of course, it's fast. And it, it, if it gives you now 1,000 snares that you can use on the spot, because but you have the knowledge of which snares do you want to begin with, you know? So, and, right. and, and, and so that's what I'm saying. Uh, will it help somebody else? I don't know, you know, uh, it will, but it will sound really repetitive and boring in my opinion. Uh, mm. But again, I don't, I'm, I'm not against that progression because it's coming. It's coming hard. It's soon is going to be in, implemented in every door, in my opinion. You know, Imagine you know, putting it. Nice. He's talking nice because he knows <laughs> AI listens right now. <laughs> and he just don't want AI to revenge. In, uh... No, no, no. I don't give a shit because in my opinion, AI will... Uh, eliminate us it's the next species so i'm going to move to a very uh secluded part in the united states like next to tiger king in oklahoma and then i will be considered irrelevant for the ai mm. so that's my right. plan because you, you won't be in its way <laughs> correct so yeah. that's my major plan so i'm not afraid of ai listening to me so that's fine yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah one thing I've, I've noticed with the um uh training models to do music stuff is it's all about curating the data set on which you train it on. Because if you just like give something every single noise possible, then the average of every single noise is just white noise basically, or silence, one of the two. So you have to be like really careful about what you train models on to get any sort of like reasonable output out of it. Yeah, good Um, result. So yeah, exactly. And also if you train it on like a bunch of loops and the loops are all different tempos and shit, then it also just gives you like pretty unusable stuff. Whereas if you train it on just jungle breaks that are just 172 BPM, then it will give you something useful. So I found like a big part of the art form with AI is actually like the curation of the data set. Like, oh, I'm going to put like 70% of these types of kick drums in and then like 30% of like these kind of different types of kick drums to get that like 70, 30 blend. Or you can like train a whole model on one type of stuff and another whole model on another type of stuff and then you can interpolate them by a certain percentage. So you can say, I want like 50% of this model and then 50% of this model or 60, 40 or whatever. I think there there are also the, the options uh, that comes with the vocal uh, capacities, you know? The, you train them on vocal models and then you get the, all the stuff like lalas, you know, all this, uh, that you sound like someone else and it's only going to sound better and better in every month now, you know, it's just crazy how fast it just grows. So. Yeah, I think it's all good. Like, I think at this point, the ability to generate um, vocals is almost as good as human sounding vocals now, so long as you train it on a solid data set. And it's just hard to get those data sets. Like the people who have trained the Drake voices, They've only trained it on Drake acapellas that exist out there and Drake acapellas that they've like used FFT shit to split the stems out of and stuff like that. And that's why they currently sound bad. But if you actually took like thousands and thousands of hours of like actual Drake recordings from the studio, they would just sound like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they will sound it's the still, same. But it's still fun. It is fun, yeah. The, the other thing that's tough with vocals is if you give a model every single word, it starts to just generate stuff that sounds like the average of all words. So it might sound like English to a non-English speaker, but to like somebody who speaks English, they'll just be like, that's gibberish. It yeah. sounds like 
like it's generating random sort of mashups of every single word basically yeah <clears throat> um you're still working on uh plugins for uh polyverse yeah we have a lot of stuff coming out um some of them are uh, harder to finish than others because we're always trying to release version one to be very good and very stable mm -hmm. and um yeah and also always thinking about removing unnecessary features and you know trying to be more focused on the on the point that to make just one very interesting um uh, let's say tool that makes uh, unique stuff that uh, hopefully don't exist much in the market you know mm. Yeah, like Manipulator, I feel like, was that. Or Supermodal as well, I think, is a good example. Yeah, and at the time also, I wish a uh, plugin. Mm. Uh, I haven't seen anything back then that does it. Um, even though after talking with Steve Duda, he made something that I think uh, did it, but I'm not sure if he released it or not. Uh, he showed it to me, so it was he had like some something that I had, n I had no idea that he did. Huh, that's yeah. cool. Yeah, he's a really good developer, man. I still think Serum is pretty unmatched. For he's, since. He's, he's the master. We love him. He's like such yeah. a <laughs> crazy, beautiful guy, genius. Uh, yeah, and he just did something that we all needed, you know? Yeah, basically took Massive and just made it way better. You know, but also the wavetable generation and stuff, you know, drag and drop stuff that he made really easy. And uh, it's, it just made it very, very, very precise and very well thought you know every detail there is he thought about it mm, yeah that's true yeah it makes sense i mean he was an engineer for a long time right he like engineered a lot of nine inch nails stuff and worked mm -hmm. you know in that field for a long time so i guess he kind of like had a good idea about like where everything was lacking at yeah. the right time you know yeah so that's cool um what what kind of plugins are you working on at the moment what what do they do um well we have a huge a set of um, very special filters. I thought I played them to you when you came over. Was that supermodal? Did that was that, that Some plugin? Of, or yeah, you heard one. You had supermodal as well. But we have a, a few interesting stuff. Uh, I want to say like even our, even it sounds like phaser-ish kind of stuff. Uh, one of the upcoming stuff. So it's even in this phaser we have a unique take that whenever it comes out you're gonna see why it's so special. Uh, I don't want to expose something too early before it's out, but uh, um, this year we have some exciting things coming out. Um, and we're also working on a synth-based, let's call it, um, a device that's uh, on the finishing, uh, you know, we're almost there, but it's hard to tell exactly when it's going to be Stable. Did you say sync-based as in like a lining phase of things? or No, no, it's, a, it's like a synthesizer kind of... Oh, synth-based, gotcha. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah I, was, I thought you said sync-based as in yeah, like so, no, something so we have a very something. interesting, uh, like, um, like uh, first, uh, like very unique ways to create uh, waveforms. Uh, so, uh, you know, finally using some unique uh, oscillators and, um, and the oscillators are they have no aliasing at all. And that's some, something that's hard to achieve in a computer. Um, mm. Anyway, you can, as soon as it's gonna come out, you're gonna, you're gonna hopefully enjoy it. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, I've really enjoyed the other plugins that you made, so I look forward to it. Are you guys doing shows at the moment or taking a break to do other shit? Uh, no, no breaks. Uh, a lot of shows, every weekend shows uh, this month, especially going back Mexican tour, Brazil, Europe, uh, and uh, we did Electric oh, Forest what? was sick. Electric Forest oh, yeah. was sick, nice. one of the best, you know. And there's, there's a lot of shows and uh, working on uh, an album that will come uh, pretty soon, which is called Reborn, which is also an interesting project we started a few years back. Is basically doing redoing very old tracks that has no files mm. uh, <laughs> in our days, but so with the sound of today, but not with an arrangement of today. That I want it to sound mm. like then with the sound of today. So, and uh, technically, you think it's easy, but it's, it's completely not. <laughs> because, yeah, because our attention spans have gone down the drain. It's because, so. Exactly. It's not long also our attention plan. Our minds is, is in a different place. 
you are not the same guy when you were 16 or 15. Uh, uh, you have way more knowledge in sound and in engineering and in building. But if you go and do a track of yourself with no files tw from 20 years ago, it will not sound the same, even if you want it to sound the same. So it's a kind of fun uh, fun project that we're doing with very old tracks. Some of them never came out, to be honest. And uh, mm. it's uh, it's been an interesting uh, interesting to do it and then play it in events and also play it in events for older people that really like the music from back in the day uh, but don't get a chance to hear it because it either had bad sound or whatever and stuff. So it's a, it's a, it's a fun project to, to work on. Uh, it's and, very uh, weird, you know, to open call it from, uh, 27 <laughs> years ago. Or, you know, yeah. you open a project, uh, like, <laughs> what files do we have left from There's 27 nothing there. years ago? There's nothing like, there. Luckily, we burned <laughs> yeah. CDs. Uh, it was a Mitsui brand. Mitsui I CDs. Think. I still have yeah. them here. They, yeah. still, <laughs> they still run. The gold uh, Mitsui gold. Wait, Africa. so you would like... Put the project file on a CD. Yeah, look, look. Oh wow, <laughs> Jesus! Wait, so this you would is, put the? Let me show you. This is project on there. there. Show us Backup the audio there. for Never Everland. Never Neverland is from our third album, who, who that came out in 2001. So this is a CD that was backed up as an audio file uh, 22 years ago. Wait, so you would back up the song as the whole audio file, or you would back up just the um, the old just parts the, of the song? Well, we used to we used to back up waves and Akai files, which nobody has an Akai to open today. Uh, <laughs> and, and so, because we used to chop loops in Akai, and as we used to sit on the Akai for for hours and chop loops, and we used to back that. And we have some backups of SoundForge. It's a weird backup system. So, yeah, and then like when you open, yeah, and then when you open the track, you say, okay. This lead, I hope we had it backed up. No, it's not backed up. So we used to back up what we thought then would be relevant, you know? And again, it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> I'm just letting you know. Like, yeah, the, so, the analog gear, like Juno, and so we used to save the, you know, the side sex and stuff, you know, of the presets, but now we don't have the Juno anymore, and you know, whatever it is. So but it's not that hard damn. to recreate these sounds. No, like, it, it, we, we were, now we when we you, designers at the time, so. Correct, and when we curate, you, you recreate the base of Juno, uh, and then you want it sounding as today, Jack, back in the day, Juno had a lot of noise. It has this character, mm. with, and now today you can cancel that. So it's different, you know. Sound-wise, it's all different. Of course, mm. you're going to choose a kick of today and not a kick from back in the day. But I'm talking about the arrangement. I'm talking about the idea, and I'm talking about the sounds. It's not as easy to re recreate a track uh, and make it sound the same back in the day. It will sound different and a little bit different from what it was. Right. And when yeah. you're like doing this process, are you staying pretty true to the arrangements that you had back then? Yes. Or are you sometimes yeah, no, no, deciding no, 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 like, no, no, oh, no. actually that whole section no. is like... No, yeah, so the thing that's, is... That's, that's where we argue so, most of the time. The, okay. <laughs> in my opinion, when you do a project like that, this is not a remix. I'm not doing a remix now to make it a banger for uh, dance floor dubstep lovers. That's not my idea of this project. The project is to do it the same and that it will impact the people who used to say, oh, you know, the story on that track back in the day, you don't do that shit anymore. And he's right. A, we choose not to do it, and B, we just don't do it. So you, know, it's in between keeping the same arrangement, and maybe when when you do a rise of back in the day, so you add a little bit of a rise, a new rise to it, but still keep it kind of the same vibe, you know. So that's that's how I see this project being made. Same for the melodies, you know. You do the melodies. So if it's a TB three or three, you do the TB three or three, but then maybe you add something more interesting to it from our days but the arrangement is almost the same mm, okay so so well, you're actually the, like are you, are you staying true to true. the tone as well Basically, where you like where you make stuff sort of more dull and subdued like it was back in the day or are you putting ott on shit and like boosting it and... uh, we're not we're not fans of ott yeah but, what? Uh, ott but, is awesome i know i know but i don't know why it just doesn't work for us so many times like we, we did mm. use it a few times but a lot of times, maybe just the, the, the way we choose to sound design is just different than, I don't know. Especially back in the day when we did our first, second, third album, okay? 
the the mm. thing that is very common to a producer today is side chaining the kick and the bass, and that they mm. will not interfere. Back this was not even suggested then. Okay, yeah, right. <laughs> now it creates a very bad sound, but it creates also melodies and stuff with a unique kind of vibe that you will today not do. Yeah, because you have to like be more cognizant of the arrangements, like of how everything interacts if you're not using side chaining. Yeah, zero and, side chaining back and in also the day. when you have bad sounds and the sound design is not that interesting, so you need to compensate with melodies or compensate with you know uh, more clever MIDI parts. Let's call it, you know. Yes. Yeah, so it's a completely different writing, a completely different vibe, and co and we were completely different people uh, mm. <laughs> 25 years ago. Yeah, so I had way more hair back then. Way more hair. <laughs> I was uh, double the crazy that I am. And uh, Erez spent most of his time in a studio. Uh, yeah, so this no was life. the day. And I would, <laughs> I would come and I sleep no at... I would come right. and sleep at that studio. So it's a different, <laughs> when you try to recreate tracks from that period, it, it, it was very interesting, very funny. And the, even the melodies sometimes, you know, melodies that are not used today and we, and we recreate them. It's fun. For me, it was fun. And now playing it again and I, and I get it, you know, I get why people fell in love with, with those stuff back then. So that's the reborn project. I and mean, I think it's really, really cool. And, uh, the, 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 from our fans, at least, the people are waiting for it, for sure. Yeah, nice. Yeah, I'm stoked to hear it. Yeah, yeah, speaking yeah. of OTT, if you look at like, uh, if you like just get a like a saw wave and you put OTT on it and you look at it through an oscilloscope, you can see it like makes it all like it fucks the phase of it up. I recently found a file online that some galaxy brain person made where it like takes the phase difference that OTT adds and flips it. So you put a impulse uh, device on the end of it, like an impulse reverb or whatever, and you put in this f f file that does like the opposite phase to OTT and it like fixes it again. Who the fuck thinks of that shit? Good times. Good Why times. Yeah. I want to know this like, person. He sounds interesting. <laughs> his name is Nasco. He's on Twitter <laughs> and he's constantly updating like Girls shit with like marriage material over there. <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah. uh, that's <laughs> never had a date in the last few weeks. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, uh, maybe not. I have no idea. So, ha how do you guys handle all of the flying? You said you went like Mexico and then to Europe and Brazil, and like, how do you handle? Because well, I, I I fly every weekend, most weekends, and I fly from like here to like Oklahoma and then Philadelphia or something, and back home, and I can barely handle that. I don't know how you handle. Yeah. Army, so I gotta like, say, over here, uh, army material. It's first. Of, oh, it's true. Start, yeah. It's it's <laughs> so because of army material. Uh, we. In fact, the Mushroom has been touring for so many years and all over the world and so man many flights. It, I think it was harder on us back in the day than today because today, me and Erez, you know, we're, we're family people. We have kids and we have so much uh, uh, stuff going on besides music. Music takes 5% of the day if we're lucky. So mm. we have so much shit going on. So when we go on those weekends, we technically close ourselves from the world and go back to what we do so right it's like relaxing yeah. in comparison to your general life 100 <laughs> percent. because I, mm. I i me i live in the car because of so much errands i have to do for my kids and for my my daily life so i live in the car so i go on thursday to a tour and come back on sunday or monday this is devoted only for shows talking music doing this doing that so for me it's kind of an escape from my real life so i don't find it as exhausting it is sometimes exhausting of course if you do like next next week we have a tour in mexico that's easy but then we fly to europe to shankara festival and from there fly to brazil for two other festivals and coming back to la that's insane Fuck flying that. insane <laughs> routing insane shows and then we come back i'm tired okay or jet lagged or whatever but still uh, it's still an escape, and uh, I, I love being on festivals. I love playing out there and testing the music, and uh, it's fun. It's fun to take what you do uh, on the studio and, and test it all the time. And a weird thing is, like, each time we get to test, like, let's say we test the Reborn on this festival, and then we come to a new festival and we test the new collaboration with Ganja White Knight, which is a completely different style of music, and we can test it on that festival. So it's, it's, it's the biggest uh testing ground and see what works and what not and this has always been our case mm. 
Speaking of army shit, did you guys both go to the army? Because for those listening who aren't aware, Israel still has conscription, right? Where like when you're 18, you have to go to the army until you're like 21 or something. Is that right? Correct. So mandatory for uh, for guys to do three years and girls do two years, 18 to 20. Still mandatory until today. I did the army. But again, I was uh, when people say, "Okay, the do the the warrior." Let's be clear. <laughs> I was a clerk with a bunch of girls, and I had parties all the time when I've been in the army. So I did learn <laughs> general. Uh, I, I did learn what to do with, let's say, guns or stuff like that. But again, I I, I was He's half a uh, ninja. Half a ninja. I am half a ninja, <laughs> but that I get the training, but I I never used it. So uh, it was fun times. And three years have passed, and day after the army, I went to Goa, India, to party. So, and then goes my. I, a lot of people do that, don't they? They like do the army, and then they go travel directly after to like clear their head or something. Correct, exactly. After three years in the army, you want to clear your head. So, most Israelis on the age of 21, uh, they go for one year either to South America, India, whatever, to clear their mind, and then they come back, and then we do what's called college here in the United States when you go 18 or university, 18 to 21. So we Make get very late. We go very late to school, uh, college, or whatever. We start at 22. So that's the Israeli way. Yeah. Hmm. That's cool. Um, yeah, in- Israel's an interesting place, man. They have the best security teams in the world. Um, all sorts of shit. Yeah, there, there was this like thing. I, I think it was made by the Israeli... Um, I think it's... Is it the NSA there or whatever it's called? The NSO, maybe. They made this thing called Pegasus, which is like this crazy zero-day thing. Do you know about this thing? Yeah, we played for them. Yeah, yeah, we played for them. (laughs) NSO is a big, big, uh, big security company, which is, by the way, it's so funny. They're hired by everyone and then by the Americans and then they went blacklisted on this and that and that. So that's the politics behind it. But yes, Israel is very high in um, uh, what we call tech. And uh, mm. we, we have so many tech going on there uh, from, if you go music from Waze to, if you go security to NSO and another other side, if you go Waze, we developed the, 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 the app and it's a, it's a huge tech country. Uh, USB. And, yeah, yeah. You invented in, USB? Yeah. Intel which all the research is in Israel. Uh, this, listen, it's a very tech country. For a small country, it's a very tech country. And mm. for me, again, the best thing in Israel is not the tech, is the food. So The food in Israel is insanely good. Yeah. That is what, you know, a lot of people are asking about infected mushroom. We're all about food. We have, for God's <laughs> sake, a, an album called The Legend of the Black Shawarma. I don't think you can name a lot of uh, bands that did an album on shawarma. So we're foodies. Uh, we grew up in Israel. Food is our thing. And we like to joke about it. But you know what? It's, 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 we have so many track of, tracks about food. And each time we eat something, okay, we got to, this, this deserves a track. This, this, this place is so good. And, and Franks. Yeah. Franks, yeah. Uh, a store. And yeah, so that's the, in my opinion, in Israel, food is the best thing out of this country. Hmm. Do you guys consider yourself a band or like an electronic music project, more one or the other? No, I mean, we don't write as a band, you know, so it's just Duvda and I, we just write. And sometimes we collab with other people, but majority but is of the, the li- time is it's just uh, us writing. And But the live shows, you're right, like we have, you know, guitar player and drummer and sometimes more, you know, like orchestras and stuff. And, Back in uh, the day, we used to differ, differentiate ourselves each time. We used to, 10 years, we used to say, okay, we're just a band. Don't call us DJs. Don't book us for DJ shows and stuff like that. But then we started DJing a little bit and say, oh, that's different. This is fun. Let's do this and stuff. So today, we don't uh, we don't care if uh, you see us as a band or a DJ duo or producers. So what's constant is, and Eric said it, it's always me and him. So we don't write with other people. But again, the vibe of the band and playing with the band is one of the most fun thing we do on the road. Uh, as opposed mm. to DJ, we also have fun. So we just... It's, it's infected mushroom. You get it. You get it. You don't get it. You know, there. The, we have so much music. You want to taste it. You want to check it out. Check it out. You want to come see a, a live band show. You get a different experience, and that's what it is. Mm. Would you say more of your shows these days are DJing or with a band? 
Lady it's more DJing, DJing. Uh, because uh, not because we we became lazy. It's because uh, festivals and and promoters they prefer the DJ sets because of the, their stages. They have a ready yeah, stage. Yeah, logistical. Correct. Logistically the logistical issue. They have a ready stage. They don't want to put another stage on it. They don't want to. So uh, we do that. But sometimes uh, when we do the live. For me, being on a live set of Infected Mushroom is the most fun. Uh, mm. we, we enjoy For sure. we enjoy it more than a DJ set. We are hanging out with the whole band. It's always fun, and uh, that's that's what, what. If you ask me on the road, if I prefer to be as a DJ band or or a band, I prefer doing the band shows. Interesting. Yeah. And how, how do you build these? Like, how do you stem stuff out? And like, what parts do you decide to remove and keep in? And like, how do you run it all to front of house and stuff like that? I'm curious, like, because I've done this before. And I'm just curious how you guys saw because that's a, it's like a basically a problem to solve, right? It's like this crazy fucking yeah, so we, uh, we, we, creative and tech problem. So there's two, uh, two, uh, let's say solutions that we came up with. First, we like to improvise. And um, so in live shows, we try to play a lot of melodies that don't exist in a track. And um, so what you get is like, oh, like a new version of the track every live show you come, it's just going to be improvised. Who knows what melody is going to play and who knows if the guitar player will play this or I will or, or Duvda is going to make weird effects with his vocal, you know. And uh, in the same time, contradicting that we do have to play the famous parts like becoming insane or whatever yeah. it is like there's some famous melodies so we do play the known parts at sometimes but the rest is all improvised so and um, it's like we for sure we remove vocals and we remove maybe some uh, distortion guitar sometimes but uh, we prefer to add to the track uh, live so a lot of times we can just play the track from the computer as is if it doesn't have vocals and then we do a lot of things on top which is way more exciting i think mm. yeah. and another main and, a, and another main thing is we took the drum kick from the drummer which is uh, yeah. very hard to do so what we do we move to an electronic kit and we just muted the volume of the bass because you cannot mute his leg he's always playing the leg you know yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> to it. so yeah so we just muted that and that makes the kick is always there kick and bass are always there and then all of all of the other stuff are improv improvisation and it's fun you know i forget the lyrics most of the time so you hear different lyrics um you know eris plays whatever he's on that uh, mood that night the guitarist yeah. Uh, they go for it and, and and it's just fun you know and we improvise and some stuff stay in the live some stuff we do for so many years that became a part of the live thing and, and uh, sometimes we say uh, to whoever it is in the don't do this again the next show it was horrible this part <laughs> was disgusting don't do yeah. it again you know? yeah don't go for it you know and yeah. uh and, and okay, each you know? And each 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 musician brings his own character. Our latest guitarist, uh, let's say Yossi, Yossi. Mizrahi, who just did So he's a very he's a guitarist that is also a producer. So for him, he likes to do tricks with the guitar, like you know, doing a tone and then pitch it up and goes forever. Mm. So he goes to that direction of playing, and that's cool. And that added another aspect to the band. So each uh, yeah, we our, have a crazy uh, chain for him for, uh, yeah. for Yossi, the guitar player. We crazy chain, wild to program. Yeah, Damn. so. We used to do some. Um, uh, 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 we used to use the plugins I Wish and uh, Manipulator and uh, stuff like that on my voice for some of the yeah. show. Gatekeeper and Ares literally plays uh, with my vocals uh, or in mm. the tail of the vocals. So that's yeah, Ed's gives me like a source, and then yeah. he is my oscillator, and then I I play on him, and then uh, on his voice with Manipulator, and uh, that add distortion on top and. And you know, uh, comet and all this kind of stuff, mm. and it's fine. And comet the main is... thing, we perfected our stage that it will be fly ready, and that's a big, big, big preparation. Yeah, that's yeah. yeah. The band thing is crazy logistics, man. I did it once, and I'll never do it again. It was correct. Too it's hard. crazy. So we we, yeah. we made the system with this our tour uh, sound guy manager Israeli. He's crazy about. Uh, OCD organization. order an organization so he perfected he built the suitcases that fit the mixers he and everything is cut so we fly in fly out as almost as easy as a DJ set not 
easy as that, but mm. almost as easy as that because we bring everything with us. We have backup for everything. We have a battery that holds the whole thing. It was well, you, Ares and, and this guy, they thought about this for years, and each year we we perfect that, and that's the main thing of an electronic live band uh, 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 touring is easy fly in and out. Right, that's yep. the main okay. thing. Yeah, yeah. This guy name is Safi Avigdor. Yeah, he's great. He's, uh, he's great. amazing. Safi. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So I did the same thing once. I did a live sh- set with a drummer, and then I had a visual, uh, two visual guys actually doing like sync visual shit. And I was sending, um, I had two uh, triggers on my drummer's kick and snare, and they would send to two triggers that would trigger two noise oscillators, like just as a click, and that would side chain everything that I was doing. And then I was sending out of my MIDI controller and from his kick and snare and from my other controllers, MIDI through OSC to the visual guys. And then every time I would like press a button or something, it would like trigger a piece of video and stuff like that. It was like this whole last thing. And we did it in a sprinter van and... I did like 35 shows and the two were gross like 30 grand. So it was less than a thousand bucks a show. And mm-hmm. we all had to sleep in the van and it was fucking horrible, man. And this, is, and, this is, and, and this is what, when we talk about touring and people always ask why we don't do what this is. The main t- thing about a tour, besides looking great, sounding great, and is actually A, not losing money. Let, let's leave aside making money. <laughs> And B, as big as it gets, you have to tour it longer just to break even and make money. And it's, yeah. <laughs> it's and, and, and and the preparation and the booking and the back end of that tour is insane amount of work. And you need a lot of people that they know what they're doing. And this is the real problem of touring. Everybody goes like, ah! Let's go on a tour, book 50 places. <laughs> Try booking 50 places from now. Now you decide until the next two years, everybody's going to go to tell you, oh, it's already booked. And then you go yeah, like, yeah. Oh, <laughs> oh, okay, so what am I supposed to do? Go to different venues, booked, go to this. Go. <laughs> so it's a very difficult thing to do. And uh, we learned it the hard way, you know, and uh, the big tours we've done, they were like hard. And we toured like two and a half years to to just break even and just to make it a, 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 a viable thing. So it's, mm-hmm. it's very difficult. And each time we go on tour, I go like, why the hell did I come into this again? But hey, <laughs> it's, it's, it's fun, so mm-hmm. whatever. You yeah. We had this fun mm-hmm. 3D projector, projection mapping tour, uh, Fungus Among Us, uh, yeah. the two spheres kind of thing, and, and it was hard to project on a circle, blah, blah, blah. But it was fun, technically, you know, but it was so challenging, you know. And, uh, Dude, I, I did the exact same thing with an inflatable bill, like my character, the potato bill thing. I had a big inflatable version of it and tried to project onto that. And the day after we like started doing it, we we're like, fuck this. And we just made like a cutout of him, like just a flat surface. And then we projected on him, but made the visual look 3D. And we're like, that makes way more fucking sense. That's good, yeah. <laughs> Again, yeah. The, the, this is things that also happen in the road. You know, we had a tour... Uh, called called animatronic. It was a huge robotic mushrooms that move, and they shoot lasers and stuff like that. And the guys that built it, they're guys from Burning Man. They build the octopus and poopo. It shoots fire and everything. So the first show we come into Best Buy after theater, a sold out show in New York, and everything is like you know planned in months, and everything is like down to the details. And we come in, and the mushroom doesn't come into the door. Because in the advance, they said they have this kind of door, but they don't. So imagine your whole production is sitting on the street and live, <laughs> sold out live show, first show of the tour. What do you do? So I call my manager. He goes like, dude, there's only one way to put this mushroom into the venue. I go like, what? He goes like, we cut it in half and we reassemble it inside the venue. And that's what we did. <laughs> So <laughs> this is insane, you know. So I'm just letting these people don't know the story, but uh, you get a heart attack on the road every day when you do yeah, a totally. massive 
tour you production. Need solutions, you know, you need yeah, solutions. solutions. Yeah, yeah. Even if they're crazy, but it's solution. crazy solutions. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Same thing yeah. happened to me when I did that same tour. It's like some of the production just wouldn't fit, like on the stage yeah. or through yeah. the doors. <laughs> yeah, it just uh, and, and with the advancing and everything, and then they go like, no, this is not going to work. About some shows that don't let us in. Like, who are you? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, security, <laughs> security and shit. You need to and wait stuff. for the main, uh, you know, promoter to call him or something. It's funny. Wow. So why, uh, why did you guys move to America? Uh, when we, at the time we lived in Israel, we we made some uh, nice collaborations with Israeli artists. One of them is Barry Sakharov, and it was number one in the charts for uh, a while. And our egos went to the sky and we're like, wow, we are, we are the best producers ever. Uh, let's try to uh, conquer the world. I'm joking, of course, you know. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and uh, we said, let's try to, to do the same thing in the U.S. Let's try to collab with some big names. So we did that. We moved to the U.S. I'm making the story short. And uh, we managed to collaborate with amazing people, you know, with The Doors. Uh, uh, Raymond Zarek came to our studio for like two weeks. And we worked on Doors songs for Warner Brothers, and um, and we had uh, Jonathan Davis from Corn, uh, Perry Farrell, uh, uh, Lady Gaga, you know some crazy stuff for a little, uh, uh, you know, two Israelis that uh, that you know do the uh, after the army, and uh, you know you know you know what I mean. It's just crazy. It's just the, the mm. thought to collaborate with such big names when you're that young is uh, seems uh, very. Uh, like the right thing to do and this is what we we've done and uh, we fell in love with the place uh, us is a very comfortable place to live um and it's just a great um i, I don't see a reason uh, uh, just to come back because it was convenient with the shows it was convenient yeah we didn't you know, we, listen uh, what Ares is not mentioning we didn't move to america uh-huh. we get we get a one year uh, uh, artist visa so this was just a uh, coming to this. work and coming back to the country that's what we got from the government mm. and then after a year we said okay we didn't finish the work let's continue the visa and we got another one year visa and then they changed the law and gave us a three years visa so It was a process that we fell in love with the place and, and just stays. It's very convenient. Uh, but, but we, we came technically for a one year uh, adventure that now is in next year is 20 years in LA. Uh, <laughs> LA is great. We, it's easy living and we fell in love with the place and, uh, and, and just stayed. You know, I even tried going back to Israel a few times. Something happens uh, with the, your yeah, sound. Yeah, I think your audio stopped working. Oh, oh it's better. <laughs> Just got a call and it happened so bad. Oh, so it's okay. Anyway, <laughs> so yeah, uh, and uh, we fell in love with the place and uh, and, and, and stayed there. I, I tried going back to Israel. I love the country, but uh, there's nothing to beat the, the, the way of living that we're living here, at least in my opinion. Yeah, I feel the same way. I basically... Did the same thing from Australia. I came here on a three-year visa yeah. and was planning to probably not be here forever. But at this point, I've been here almost 10 years. And I, I don't, I've been, same deal. I've gone back to Australia a few times. And I'm like, yeah, this is boring. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, uh, the it's the song, Hotel California. You know, you, you check in, <laughs> but you cannot check out. I used, to, I, I used to think it's a very funny song, but it's a really big reality song. It's very hard to, to, to live uh, where we're at. So, yeah. Mm. How do you feel about the the crowds here versus other places in the world? Like I know Psytrance is massive in Israel, it's pretty big in Australia, huge in Brazil, obviously. Um, how do you feel uh, playing Psytrance in America? Do you find the reactions are different to those other places or are they basically, is it pretty similar? I think, I think they react very well to Psytrance, uh, not in the same way maybe, but... Um, but um, The nice thing about here that they are very more they're very open-minded to different genres unlike uh, like some other places even Israel uh, they're less open like if you're gonna play dubstep in the middle of a citron set in Israel you it's they're really not gonna like it you know it's yeah. uh, the, the, and, and the US is very open-minded to changing beats changing tempos changing just surprise them you know and um, I like that too you know No, and what happened with the EDM scene over here uh, with companies like Insomniac and all of these, 
uh, EDM is huge here. Uh, so every aspect of it is huge. Dubstep, uh, glitch hop, uh, trance, techno. So when you go on a stage, you can play whatever you're going to play. Uh, the crowd is not that surprised because he heard it from mm. some other genre and stuff. So you can kind of play mm. in between as opposed to Brazil. If I go play a infected mushroom set and I play like a little bit of a dubstep half tempo over there, they go like, what the fuck is he doing? You know, because they're coming <laughs> to see only a, a secured special set of Psytrance. So what Eric is saying is the crowd over here is way, way easier to play some uh, more uh, diverse music to. I can throw out a drum and bass in there and nobody's going to go like, what the fuck is he doing? You know, and that's what we like playing in America. Uh, as opposed when I go mm. to play in Australia, uh, side trans tour, seven shows, they know what they want and they want to hear that specific sound. So that's the main difference in the American crowd. Yeah, I find that as well. It's like a, they're okay with like, because I guess like music is basically all about setting expectations and then either meeting them or not right and if you Correct. don't meet the expectations here people don't mind the challenge whereas if you don't meet expectations i find in say somewhere like australia people don't like being challenged in that way they go like what the fuck i feel slightly challenged and uncomfortable this is bullshit yeah. and as much as we are an older band and we are here for so many years we find some of the remarks very funny you know some some promoter goes like i really want you to play old school music and i go like what do you mean we're like which he goes like vicious delicious i go like that's our sixth album what it, so even the guys that are talking to you sometimes they don't understand what they're saying you know i can play old school I mean, music i mean for them old school is maybe five years ago correct yeah. for them yeah. it's five it's years like ago five but for me yeah. it's from 25 <laughs> years ago so I'm, i'm just saying i don't know what you're saying to begin with so i i I really want today in our days that to play, basically we play whatever we want, me and Eric, but we, we kind of found a way to adjust ourselves to sets. You know, if you, if you book us to this, book us to that, we know what to play. We have so much music to play with. So it's, it's fun to play to the crowd. And, um, and, and, and we're lucky that we can play all over the world and have a fan base all over the world. We're just lucky. Mm. Yeah, totally. I, so when you do the live sets, I imagine it takes some sort of amount of preparation beforehand. Are you able to flexibly switch up the track list for those or is it kind of pretty much set in stone before you play the show? Pretty much set in stone, but before the show, I kind of talk with Ares and say, listen, we're playing in Denver. Let's throw a three different tracks in this show put it more bassy this is more of a bassy crowd so we kind of can be changed until five minutes before the show <laughs> correct we can change five minutes before. <laughs> yeah it's very adaptable for us don't always love it but uh, they don't love it is, i go like to the, the, the <laughs> with something new you know? Eres goes like today mm. we're playing this and this and that this two you didn't play for 10 years and this one you don't know it but just go, yeah. ahead. <laughs> go ahead it's Listen, gonna be fine the, this is the core progression here you go Good luck. Yeah, you're gonna, and they're badass, and they, they always kill it, and it's fine. I like it sometimes even more when they, they first improvise, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah. So people who are like insanely good at music blow my mind. Like when I make melodies, or I think of Dev's video as Frozen. Um, whenever I make like a melody or something, it's just noodling around. Like I just draw, draw in notes in the MIDI thing, and I never know even what key my song is at the end. And I like I don't even think about that shit. It blows my mind to like see someone like for instance a session player for an orchestra or something where you can just give them sheet music and they just play it like a fucking midi instrument basically it's like they crazy like first time around they just nail it it's crazy yeah <clears throat> yeah i wish i wish i could do that how did you learn music by the way or we how did you both we learn? were forced by our parents you know mm. if you're not uh, learning they will uh, just put on your necklace that they press a button and They have electricity in it? <laughs> no, I'm joking. No, you had to basically do something. And you know, when the parents push you at such a young age, like five years old, you just go and do it. You know, you don't know any better. And I think both of us really um, fell in love with music regardless. It's like, it's a fun thing to do for us. Uh, just to sit and think about new melodies and, uh, I don't know, just, just be around music. You know what I'm saying? It's just, it's, it's a fun thing. It's a fun occupation for us. It's not a job. It's not a... Uh, It's like yeah. a game. Seriously, I can't believe we're getting paid for this stuff. 
Um, are you, you primarily play piano, right? Or do you know other instruments as well? I play uh, guitar. I, I, like in, m- most of the infected mushroom guitars in the albums are um, uh, me playing, and but it's chopped, you know, so it's not... Mm. Uh, an, uh, and um, the the good guitar pl- parts, I think, are the people are thinking are great. Actually, synth. And, right. Uh, <laughs> and do you um do you do reamping where you like yeah uh, play the guitars dry and then edit them and then reamp them? Always. Yeah, that's the way to do it, man. It took me so long to figure that shit out, but once I did, I was like, ah, oh, that's how you get everything sounding actually good. Yeah, distortion always helps, you know. It's yeah, funny so. with some of our main uh, distortion parts all over the years, people are always asking uh, me, so which guitarist played the distortion part in heavyweight? I go like, that's not a guitar. <laughs> and this is such a known solo in heavyweight, and I go like, that's Ares. Yo, note. speaking of uh, heavyweight, I've still got to remix that. I've had the files for ages, and every time I like go and try to remix it, I feel like I spend like a whole day on it, and I get like five percent done. Like I, uh, it's like so much in that track, man. Like it's hard to pick like a motif to remix because there's so many motifs in it, and I'm like, and, which and I, I agree, <laughs> and that's what that's what's so unique about that track or a few tracks of that. That the whole point of those tracks was to do a journey uh, of so much stuff going on and changing. And when you choose a little part of it and do it, it just doesn't uh, do just to the track. But again, on the uh, same, having said that, it could be a heavyweight, called heavyweight remix or, 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 uh, or part one, let's say, and then take it to a different direction completely for newer crowds. It doesn't have mm. to do, you know, doing just to an original Always when I go remix something, I'm not doing just to the original because I right. love the original, at least me. Uh, mm. When I choose a track, I, I just love it. And then people come to me and say, oh, this is so much better than the original. Well, for you, not. Mm, I still <laughs> think the original, like, <laughs> kicks. I get this a lot from people, fans of ours, says, your Foo Fighters cover is way better than the original. I go, like, well, <laughs> that's, that's your taste. I love the original way better. So... I I I, I didn't know I don't know if I did it just I just took it to a different direction you know so that's mm. yeah I th- think probably what I'm gonna do with the heavyweight remix is keep the arrangement with all the sections the same and keep each motif for each section but just remix each section basically and yeah that's great idea. that's a great yeah. idea yeah I feel like trying to rearrange that song is just a head fuck man it's like impossible or doing from the end to the beginning like change yeah the do it backwards or something <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't know yeah that could possibly work we'll see. Yeah. Well, hey, man, um, I appreciate you guys taking the time to come on and chat for an, for an hour. And yeah, welcome to come chat again anytime. I love chatting. It's with our guys. pleasure. Yeah. And I can't wait to see what you do now with the track uh, that we're with. I, I kind of really love I really love the, 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 the parts, but let's make sense of it because it's, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a bit all over the place. <laughs> Right, yeah, kind of yeah. like heavyweight too, right? It's like yeah, a lot of yeah. different parts that if you yeah. can connect them properly, awesome, but it's really fucking hard to connect them all properly. But yeah, I'm actually going to go work on it again right now. So I'll send you an update. I, I can send yeah. you an update tonight even. Whenever it whenever it's ready, just send us an update. We'll, uh, I'll love to Can't see wait, man. You, where, where you went with it. Fuck yeah. All right, dude. Well, thanks, guys. Thank you for doing this podcast, man. You are the Joe Rogan of audio, you know? I I always (laughs) call you that. You are the EDM Joe Rogan. I love your podcast. Good times, uh, guys. It's an honor to be here. Thank you. Fuck out. Cheers. Bye. Yo, what's up? Thanks for listening to the Mr. Bill podcast. This show is produced and edited by Robert Fumo. You can get early access to the show by going to my website, mrbillstunes.com and paying me instead of Patreon. And remember to go rate and review on iTunes or I'm going to come to your house and punch your dog in the throat, upper deck your toilet and fuck your partner. Note, I may or may not do those last couple of things. Uh, You should probably just go rate it on iTunes or Spotify or whatever it is that you listen to the podcast on because it really helps the podcast. Um, But but just know that, that it'll go a long fucking way to me not doing those things if you do go do that. So uh, just, just putting that out there.